Uh, I got involved as a 15-year-old activist in the anti-apartheid struggle uh, actually from a very basic sort of need which was to stand up against uh, the inequality in education. In fact, uh, we didn't really understand the full bigger politics of the apartheid system. For example, the first slogan that I was part of shouting in the front of the march, people were saying, we want equality. By the time the slogan got to the back of the march, people were saying, we want a color TV. Because at that time, kids in white schools had televisions and kids in black schools had nothing. Uh, but that experience of um, starting with the consciousness of people that you're trying to organize and trying to actually not make what I think is the cardinal mistake of activism, where activists project their consciousness on the people that they're trying to organize rather than humbling themselves and understanding where people's minds quite often have been poisoned by a very uh, state corporate controlled media is a mistake I think we make all the time and that lesson I've carried throughout my life from uh, my teenage years. Uh, of course I was in exile, came back after the first democratic elections, decided to stay out of government and work to strengthen um, civil society. In fact, the joke we used to have in the period of the transition from apartheid to democracy was that the term NGO in the South African context at that time didn't stand for non-governmental organization, but actually more appropriately could be for next government official because so many people went from the NGO community into government. But after a few years of the transition to democracy, one of the things that became very clear to me and others is that even if in developing countries we had efficient, ethical, non-corrupt political leaders, that the reality of how global power operated was that we couldn't actually advance our societies to the point that we needed because the slogan that emerged in the 1980s globally, which said, think globally, act locally, which meant irrespective of the issues you were trying to address at the local or national level, you need to understand our global processes, global discourse and global power add an impact on what you could or could not achieve at the local or national level was in fact now not exactly appropriate because if you think globally and you act solely locally and if real power is shifting to global institutions such as the WT World Trade Organization or the World Bank or uh, other uh, intergovernmental organizations at the supranational level, then in fact people, particularly in developing countries whose governments do not sit at the G8 or the G20, are then actually removing themselves where power is increasingly shifting. So in fact the feminist leader in India, Devaki Jain, uh, said maybe what we should do is turn it upside down, which is think locally in terms of what our needs are and if real power is shifting to the global level, then we should actually act globally. I, of course, am much of a view that we don't have the luxury of choosing one or the other. Uh, we have to think and act locally and globally, and we have to make judgment calls about where our energy of activism should go to depending on what the issue is. Sometimes by putting all your energy at a local level and winning can have global impact, you know, way beyond simply trying to influence a UN resolution or a World Bank policy decision. On other times, being able to get a global institution to take the appropriate decision that puts people first ahead of corporations' interests and so on can give you a global impact. So because of all of that sort of ferment in my own thinking at that time when Civicus World Alliance for Citizen Participation, which is a global umbrella body um, for non-profit sector, approached me. I agreed to join and for 10 years worked as the Secretary General of the Civicus World Alliance for Citizen Participation. And during that time, one of the things that became clear to me was that 
one of the weakness in activism was that we actually mirrored the same dysfunctionality that existed within governments in the non-profit sector, which is, you know, we had an environment box, a poverty box, a peace box, a youth development box, and so on. And that, in fact, we needed to actually bring those agendas closer. And I did quite a lot of work at Civicus trying to bridge those gaps um, within civil society. But as an African, I began to get more and more concerned and aware that in fact environmental destruction uh, was actually driving poverty and making the circumstances of poor people worse and worse. And on the other hand, poverty was also then a driver of environmental destruction because if somebody does not have access to energy and they live in a forest, they are going to chop down trees to actually burn fuel to, uh, to, you know, to, to, for, for energy. So I then began to volunteer for, in different uh, environmental organizations and served on the boards of uh, Earth Rights International, which does environmental litigation, which is based in the United States, uh, the Global Reporting Initiative, which uh, GRI, that encourages governments and businesses to report on social and environmental impact based in Europe. And then in Africa, I volunteered to be on the board of Food and Trees for Africa that does more service delivery type of work. To be honest, at the end of my time at Civicus, I didn't really want to work globally again. I'd lived out of a suitcase for 10 years and didn't particularly like it, and was actually wanting to go back to grassroots activism, um, which is something where I come from, and actually, if I think of all the different things I've done in my life, the thing that gives me most personal satisfaction is in fact grassroots activism. But um, when people ask me why did I join Greenpeace, I say the reason was that my daughter told me to. And it is actually exactly the case because Greenpeace approached me while I was in the middle of a hunger strike to put pressure on my own government in South Africa to stop protecting the dictatorship of Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe. And Greenpeace called me on the 19th day of the hunger strike when I'd just been on water for 19 days. And I said, sorry, you know, the timing is a bit bad. Uh, but that evening, my daughter called me. She had seen me on BBC um, and she was in the UK. And she said, Dad, why are you still doing interviews? You're looking like a skeleton and so on. So I said, no, no, I did that like five days ago. She said, oh, that means you're even more thinner <laughs> now since I saw you. And then I said, no, I only took this call from you and the folks from Greenpeace called from Amsterdam. And she asked me what I said to them. I said, bad timing. And she said, Dad, I won't speak to you if you do not give it serious consideration because Greenpeace and the mission of Greenpeace is about my future and about protecting this planet. And unlike some other organizations, they don't only talk, 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 they're prepared to take peaceful and nonviolent direct action. And I really would like you to consider it. I was quite taken aback by it, actually. It was the first time she laid out a card so clearly about where she stood. Because when she was younger, she would always joke with me and say, Dad, I'm not going to be like you and worry about everybody else in the world. I'm going to go in business, make a lot of money. You know, and it was the first time. And then she said, you know, Greenpeace is the kind of organization that I'd like to work with for the future. And the entire process of my application, she was involved in writing the, the letter of application, editing it, and so on. Uh, but, I t I, you know, I choose to tell the story. Of course, you know, even some of my colleagues in Greenpeace think, it's not uh, to say that you did it because your 16-year-old daughter told you to do it. But I, I advisedly choose to tell the story because I think the struggle to end environmental discussion and prevent climate catastrophe is not about some nebulous struggle about saving the environment and saving the planet and saving the climate. But it's a struggle to secure our children and grandchildren's future. The planet itself will, be, will survive. It's whether human beings' ability to be on this planet is what is at stake. So the day one I started at Greenpeace, it was very interesting for me because 
virtually every interview I did, whether it was with people in Canada, US, Europe, Asia, Latin America, the question was, so you're giving up on poverty and you're going to the environment. Mm. And I genuinely have been arguing, way before Greenpeace anyway, that the struggle to end global poverty and the struggle to ensure environmental sustainability and prevent climate catastrophe has to be seen as two sides of the same coin. And unless we can bring those two agendas together, we do not stand a chance. As a young uh, student in exile when I was in the US, I heard for the first time, for example, this phrase, the red-green tensions. This was the tensions between labor and environment. And today I'm really happy to say in my work at Greenpeace, we are talking now about a red-green alliance between the unions working closely with us uh, to actually advance things like, for example, for the first time the global trade union movement has a woman leader, uh, Sharon Burrows from Australia. And this is not to be just to be immodest, but she speaks on the environment more eloquently than I do. At the Rio Plus 20 summit, uh, when we had a meeting with the Secretary General of the UN, Sharon Burrows, the head of the international trade union movement, said, to the Secretary General, our main agenda is to promote decent work and decent jobs. And why we as trade unionists are committed to the struggle to end catastrophic climate or prevent catastrophic climate change is because there are no decent jobs on a dead planet. And I think the important thing that all of us in the various different movements, whether it's on gender justice or trade justice, economic justice, social justice, have to actually take time now to really quickly get right is to look at the intersections between the different struggles. In fact, I think the women's movement uh, decades ago provided us with a very powerful wisdom, but perhaps not the best word, when they talked about intersectionality, right? You know, understanding how gender, if you want to advance gender equality, how do you do it? By understanding how gender intersects with race, class, ability, religion, and, and whatever else, you know. So I think that's like a a task that all of us, in whatever issue of justice we're working on, I think not only it's a strategic thing to do, but I also think that today we need to understand that it's irresponsible not to make the connections of where our different struggles intersect. A museum focus on peace and justice must leave every person who enters it when they leave. The one important thing that they need to internalize, I think, is that action speaks louder than words and peaceful action speaks the loudest in terms of trying to get your action, uh, trying to get your agenda advanced. Having been through the brutality of the struggle against apartheid, I'm now very clear in my mind that even though often there might be justifications why people would arrive at a conclusion that the excessive violence of the state um, requires a, a element of uh, violence in opposition. I think I'm sh of a view now that we dehumanize ourselves when in fact we actually embrace violence as a legitimate way of struggle. And while it might be legitimate in legal terms and so on, we need to think about the after effects of those that are involved, you know. And, you know, if you look at the United States and you look at the psychological brut brutality of what people who go to war when they come back and, and how they are abandoned by those that send them to war, you want museums, not only peace and justice museums, you want museums to tell, ideally, in an ideal world, the true story about the power and the intrinsic value of peace, why justice is actually central to peace, and why, in fact, with violence, humanity always loses, wherever it comes from. Without, of course, necessarily 
putting itself, putting oneself or putting the institution in a position where they are judging people who are living under extreme conditions. I mean, a woman who experienced serial uh, uh, battery in terms of domestic violence, for example, I as a man do not feel I can say a violent response is not a response that was necessary, right? But I think even if you look at women who have had to respond like that, the pain they have to carry beyond their own abuse that they might have faced for a long time, the fact that they had to liberate themselves through an action of violence against a violent partner actually adds another layer of psychological damage is my sense. So I think a Peace and Justice Museum uh, must speak truth to power, uh, must be willing to raise the uncomfortable questions uh, and you know the significance of having it in Philadelphia and in the United States for me is extremely important because I think that to the majority of the people in the world today, sadly, the vision of the United States, when one looks at it, is one of violence and brutality. Uh, right now, the use of drones, for example, in many parts of the world, uh, the inconsistency which how the UN will stand up for people, say, in Libya, but will allow and almost encourage the, the encourage through the silence and ambiguity violence against the people of Bahrain because unfortunately the logic that still informs US foreign policy is like how one famous US politician once said referring to the situation in Nicaragua uh, with the Somoza dictatorship said Somoza might be a son of a bitch but he is our son of a bitch. So I think a Peace and Justice Museum has to be bold in actually understanding the history of where society has come from and should hold up a mirror to people who attend for them to look at their own role and their own culpability by opting for silence in their own life in the face of injustice and inconsistency of where the United States, for example, says one thing at home and does another thing abroad. Says we are against torture at home but will engage in torture abroad. And that is just unacceptable and that actually ultimately leads to greater conflict and violence in the world. I think if we are brutally honest, the current and previous adult leadership has actually brought us to this point of being on the brink of climate catastrophe, on a financial crisis, on a food crisis and so on. For young people to actually invest the faith in the current crop of adult leadership and yeah sadly I'm not only talking government and business but I would also say in civil society as well is a bad miscalculation. So I would say to young people today, they should resist the saying when adults say young people are the leaders of tomorrow. I think young people have to step forward and actually take leadership now. If we look at some of the momentous changes that we have seen in the world, if we look at the Arab uh, revolutions, young people were a central part of that. Uh, if I look everywhere in the world where I go, um, in my role in Greenpeace, it is young people that are in the forefront of the climate justice movements, the young people who get it. And the reality is, is there's a complete absence of intergenerational solidarity. The current adult leadership, particularly in government and business, are governing this planet in a way that suggests that we don't have children and grandchildren and future generations coming. They are driving the planetary uh, limits to the absolute extent. Um, you know, we're looking at oceans being destroyed in four, four decades if we don't turn 
uh, seriously in a different direction. So I think also young people, you know, the approach of adults usually is to see them half empty rather than half full. You know, they look at what young people don't have rather than what pe young people have. And I think history has shown that when push comes to shove, when injustice gets to the point where people have to say enough is enough and no more, it is young people who step forward first. If you look at the Occupy movement uh, that, we, that captured the world, if you look at the profile of the movement, of course they were inspiring adult leaders that were there as well, but largely it was driven by the passion and the vision of young people. But the most important thing young people bring, I think, is a fresh lens. They can look at the world and say, well, actually, this hasn't worked before. Why should we try it again? You know, as Albert Einstein put it, you know, insanity, the definition of insanity is trying to do the same thing that you've always done and expecting to get different results. Or so putting it differently, if you do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. And that is the trap that our current leadership are in. I mean, you know, President Obama, for example, would appear to be a well-meaning person with decent values and so on, but he's stuck in a system where he has to largely follow that which comes before him and the defense of current institutions that drive inequality, that drive conflict, that drive um, an imbalance of society as well as the world has to be challenged. And I think it's only young people who take the time to educate themselves and that's why a museum is a very, is, can be a catalytic institution to actually infuse new knowledge, ask new questions and so on. But I also think that, you know, um, a museum should not be judgmental. It should create the basis for people and an enabling environment for young people and older people to actually arrive at their own conclusions by providing valid, authentic, historical knowledge and helping pose the right questions so people can actually explore different parts to actually generate new ideas and new solutions. It's important also that for young people not to um, not to get consumed by pessimism because that's the main thing I find I'm doing now like you know we're I'm speaking to people who, where people actually can't come into the conclusion that we're gonna lose you know when we look at the facts on our environment when we look at what where the climate negotiations are and where the scientist tells us to be and where the climate negotiations are it's understandable why so many people feel so desperately uh, pessimistic. And yeah, I would say there's a very helpful Mahatma Gandhi quotation which I draw a lot of uh, support from. Gandhi once said, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. Let's be very clear. They, those with power in government and business, are not ignoring us, they're not laughing at us, they are fighting us. And let's hope the fact that they are fighting us means that we are one step away from actually winning.